national artists. They contributed to a national art. And what I was suggesting is that there is a universalist dimension to their art. They were in constant conversation uh, with uh, artists in other parts of Asia, and they are, you know, and including West Asia. Um, and that, I think, is important to recognize. Just imagine that slide that I showed you of the Asian landscape. You know, you wouldn't know, you know, if I didn't sort of tell you that it's an Indian painting. It could just as well be a Japanese or a Chinese painting. Um, as for um, the um, uh, trip that Tagore made in 1932 to, uh, to Iran and uh, Iraq, uh, one of the things that happened, of course, was that he was able to raise an endowment for Persian studies at his university. So that was one very sort of material result that came out of this trip. You know, he knew that universities uh, need, uh, you know, benefactors like Dr. Love and Dr. Ho. And so when he traveled around the world, you know, even when he gave lectures, the fees that he would get uh, would often go into the coffers of the university that he was trying to build. Uh, so, just as he had instituted Japanese, Chinese, Southeast Asian studies, <coughs> Indonesian studies at, at Shantaniketan, he introduced Persian studies. Uh, as for Iraq, he did interact with uh, Arab uh, poets and intellectuals, and um, since somebody mentioned drones, you know, that was the early period when, you know, there was, there, you know, there was bombing from the air that was taking place. Uh, in, uh, because there had been some villagers up in revolt. And Tagore made an impassioned plea uh, not to turn the skies, which is a domain of the divine, uh, into this uh, venue for warfare. And, and he said that it was very easy to kill the desert dwellers from the air. And those who are doing the killing uh, don't even feel that they are actually engaged in this. Uh, process uh, because it's done from such a long sort of distance and but he said that this was like invading the space of divine dreams turning the sky into something that was that is that is rather profane and uh, but of course he was visiting Iraq at the time of the early years of the depression and therefore, there were some difficulties later on because from the many, many of the Arab countries, there were Indian immigrants who faced some kind of a backlash as well as the depression drew on. So the economic crisis, the worldwide economic crisis, can always also lead to tensions between different kinds of people. So Tegos' visit did not solve in the medium term uh, the, the problems of peace and understanding and cooperation among peoples that he wanted to, to achieve. And of course, before his death, he was very sad that on a global scale, you know, the whole world was seeming to be falling apart with, you know, the outbreak of yet another world conflict. Hi, my name is Ashmi. I'm a student in FSSK, International Relations, and I'm, I'm an Indian. I've heard about uh, Ravindranath Tagore when I was a child, when my teacher asked me, Go to Bande Mataram, and I was really impressed by him. And when I grew up, and now I took his politics, and now I keep on reading about the, uh, the fights between BJP and the stuff like that, who supports the Hinduism, idea of Hinduism, and then the killing the people that recently happened in, um, in, in Odisha, some place. They killed about 3,000 people. And I don't know, my mind's always related that it's history, science, or whatever, it's come up with international relations or related with conflict. So I'm thinking and when we have such a great people like Gandhiji and Ravindranath Tagore, how can the modern uh, Hindu leaders they don't understand that thing, and they are, I don't know where they go to study, and where's the, uh, the breakup? How come they, when the Ravindranath Tagore's teaching, Gandhiji's teaching, broke up, and then it, and it's like, it came up like the modern politicians or modern Hindu uh, supporters which we have in India. So these 
this thought bothers me a lot. And many people ask me about this, so I'm just thinking if I can get the answer today. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I, I share your uh, concern, and I'm glad you have uh, asked this question. Uh, I should, of course, correct you on one small point. Uh, Tagore did not write the poem or the song Bande Mataram. That was written by Bonkim Chandra Chatterjee, <laughs> another Bengali poet. But Tagore did write uh, the song Janagana Mono Jayate, which is the national anthem of India. And he also wrote the song, Amar Shonar Bangla, which happens to be the national anthem of Bangladesh. Even though Bangladesh is a Muslim majority country, it adopted uh, Tagore's song because of its beautiful literary quality as, you know, uh, the national, uh, national anthem. Um, and in fact, in some ways, uh, Tagore was a bit critical of the use of uh, Bande Mataram on national platforms. In 1937, there was a bit of a controversy. Uh, you know, the Indian National Congress had done quite well at, by that time, and the Muslim League was questioning the Congress's triumphalism, the singing of Bande Mataram. If you look at the song, Bande Mataram, uh, the first verse is, a, is an evocation of the natural beauty of the land of India. But in the second verse, there is an equation of the, of the mother country with the mother goddess. And Tagore actually said that uh, he, he likes the first verse of the song, and that can be sung at national gatherings, but he said that in a multi-religious country like India, uh, you know, the, the equation of mother goddess with mother nation was inappropriate to be used as a kind of national anthem. And so from that point onward, only the first verse of that song would be performed at, you know, Congress sessions, for example, at Paripura, uh, from where I showed you some pictures in 1938. So he was very sensitive uh, to the concerns of the minorities, and he felt that, uh, you know, you, you had to be, and you, you had to be generous uh, towards, the, uh, towards the minorities. And, of course, uh, the Hinduism of uh, Vivekananda, whom I mentioned in passing, or the Hinduism of a Tagore is not the kind of Hinduism that is preached by some political leaders of the Hindu right in India today. And I think we need to make a distinction between religion as faith and religion as identity. Religion as faith is of course partly personal, but it can also inspire large social and political movements. Religion as identity differentiates between people according to their religious communities. So first of all, that's a distinction that we need to make. But the other point that I would also make is that it is very important to distinguish between religious sensibility and religious bigotry or prejudice. And sometimes in the name of secularism, we try to make religion our enemy and that i think is a mistake uh, the overwhelming majority of the people of india or pakistan or bangladesh or i believe malaysia as well are probably deeply religious they have religious faith uh, they have religious sensibility but i'm also quite confident that the overwhelming majority among them uh, don't harbor prejudice against members of other religious communities. They are not religious figures. Uh, and it's the Zahiri Khutbin that uh, I was mentioning, you know, religious. So let us make sure that, uh, let us take a stand against those who preach hatred in the name of religion or preach religious bigotry. But let us also be respectful of religious faith, religious sensibility, which is so very important in the lives of ordinary people. So that's the way I would go about it. And when political leaders use religion to make people fight against one another, that needs to be questioned and fought and condemned. Uh, but you know, but we, we need to be respectful of you know, uh, the re religious uh, faith, beliefs, practices of, uh, of people. And I think Tagore is rather good here. He 
he felt that unity should not be con confused with uni uniformity. Uh, you have to respect difference. It's only by respecting difference, religious difference included, and then restraining that difference in its proper place that you can really fashion unity in the long term. You can't have unity by just declaring that everybody is one. So let us acknowledge, respect difference, and then build larger unities on that basis. Any more questions? You have some more comments? Okay. Uh, if there is no takers, then I don't be sufficient in the slide. Because it's only a, an excellent lecture will push you to ask more questions. Um, I'm interested in your explanation about uh, religiously informed uh, universalism. Uh, and not so much as a concept, but how different religions when it arrived, or they arrived in different areas, they will be arriving to, an, to areas where there, are, there were previous religions or existing religions. So the argument is that each of these religions over time get embedded into different uh, social cultural contexts, including uh, what we, I think, call syncretism and so on which probably is not fair to see that way. But necessarily, as a result of this embedding of these different uh, forms, and this embedding is not only about ideas, it's also about uh, through marriages and conversions, and you will see the creolization of the religion, uh, in a way, whether linguistically, whether in terms of people. So there is, so, and, and the religion further spread to other religions. So if you take Islam from, to Persia, to India, to China, and then come to South Asia, you can see the series of creolization. So these are religious people. I'm not using the term creolization in a de uh, derogatory sense. I'm just uh, indicating the way people become uh, embedded into different things. So uh, therefore, what we are looking at in the spread of this religion, whether Hinduism, Buddhism, or Islam in the end, are actually the intellectual product of this creolization. I mean, in another sense, in a colonial context, creolization could be derogatory because uh, it involves uh, mestizos, mulattos, and so on and so forth. Yeah? But I think uh, in that religiously um, informed universalism, the richness, uh, this is whose book is very important, uh, yeah, uh, on, on, on the Hadrami, in the sense of proving to us that the richness of religion multiplies as become creolized. So, I don't know, your study has been mainly on in, the intersection of economy and, and social and how we shouldn't see uh, the national boundaries as the only boundaries. And so I'm looking at in, in the non-national boundaries. I would like to have your response. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, I, I entirely agree with your formulation, which was very well put. Uh, that uh, you know, creolization in the sense that you are using that uh, that term uh, adds to augments the richness of of religion, uh, and uh, we we need to be uh, cognizant of, of that sort of fact. Let me make a couple of com comments. You mentioned in passing the the term syncretism. Uh, I think there are many problems with the literature on syncretism. Uh, that's because, you know, sometimes there is an assumption uh, that, um, uh, that when two or three two different religions came together in a particular region, they mingled, they became syncretic, uh, and it became some kind of an undifferentiated folk tradition. 